Bien, les vamos a dar la bienvenida a todos ustedes a este segundo seminario internacional CEDLE, cómo liderar escuelas vulnerables, aprendizajes para directivos escolares desde la experiencia internacional. Este seminario está organizado por el Centro de Desarrollo del Liderazgo Educativo CEDLE, constituido por la Universidad Diego Portales, la Universidad Alberto Hurtado, también la Universidad de Talca y la Universidad Católica de Temuco, en conjunto con la Escuela de Graduados de la Universidad de California, Berkeley y bajo el patrocinio del Ministerio de Educación. Por supuesto queremos agradecer la presencia del director del Centro de Desarrollo del Liderazgo Educativo, don José Weinstein, y también, por supuesto, darle la bienvenida a nuestro invitado internacional, al doctor Christopher Day, académico de la Universidad de Nottingham, Reino Unido, y por supuesto también la bienvenida a los directivos escolares, profesores del sistema escolar, supervisores ministeriales, académicos, profesionales, investigadores, estudiantes de pre y posgrado que nos acompañan en el día de hoy. A todos ustedes, muy buenos días, bienvenidas y bienvenidos. Por supuesto, para dar inicio a esta actividad, con este, a, con este encuentro en este seminario internacional, vamos a invitar inmediatamente al doctor José Weinstein, director del Centro de Desarrollo del Liderazgo Educativo, académico e investigador de la Universidad Diego Portales. Muy buenos días, buenos días a todos, a todos, a pesar del frío tenemos que tener ánimo, yo creo que esta mañana helada que tenemos en Santiago, pero creemos que para una actividad muy importante, muy interesante, eh, el tema del liderazgo educativo y el liderazgo directivo en particular, ustedes saben que ha sido un tema muy relevado en nuestro país, al menos desde el año 2005 en adelante notamos una tendencia creciente a diferenciar los roles y a claramente buscar que los directivos escolares sean también líderes educativos y agentes de cambio. Hasta ahí, la verdad es que en nuestro país habíamos operado con la misma legislación con que el año 27 se había creado el Ministerio de Educación y se había hecho, no es cierto, una asignación en la cual básicamente los directores de escuela, directores de liceo, cumplían con el rol de transmitir las directrices centrales que venían desde la política educativa, le hace el Ministerio de Educación, hacia el centro escolar. Y esa es la tarea principal que tenían en sus manos los directivos escolares. Cómo transmitir bien lo que llegaba de la política educativa. Y cómo ser eficientes ejecutores de normas, políticas, iniciativas. Pero desde el año 2005 en adelante se hizo un cambio en la legislación que manifestaba un cambio mayor en la política y que consistió en decir no, esa no es la tarea principal de los directivos escolares. La tarea principal de los directivos escolares es ser agentes de cambio en su escuela y ser líderes quienes encabecen los proyectos educativos que cada escuela tiene. Por lo tanto hay un cambio muy radical respecto a lo que se les pedía a los directivos escolares, a lo que se les empezó a pedir hace muy poco tiempo atrás, hace solo una década. Y de ahí en adelante, de manera no siempre consistente, la política educativa ha ido dándole más facultades, más atribuciones a los directivos escolares. Solamente para llevar un ejemplo actual, si vemos el estatuto de la nueva carrera docente, ¿no es cierto?, recientemente legislada, podremos ver que en ella hay al menos tres nuevas responsabilidades que tienen los directivos escolares. Ellos por de pronto incorporan algo que es nuevo, que es el hecho de tener que elaborar planes de desarrollo profesional para todos los docentes que trabajan en su establecimiento. Hasta aquí, ¿no es cierto?, el desarrollo profesional en nuestro país era algo que más bien era como responsabilidad de cada quien. No era algo colectivo, ni era algo en que se tuviese que inmiscuir ¿ya? la dirección de la escuela. Eso era hasta por ahí nomás, porque efectivamente si vemos, ¿no es cierto?, en que han sido usados los recursos como la CEP u otros planes de mejora, vemos que los directivos habían incidido mucho en la formación, y sobre todo en la formación colectiva de los docentes. Pues bien, desde la nueva carrera en adelante, los directores y directoras de escuelas tienen que elaborar un plan de desarrollo profesional, 
Y por lo tanto tienen que empezar a ver también a sus docentes como personas que tienen que crecer profesionalmente y de alguna manera, ¿no es cierto?, asesorarlos en esa dirección. Saber también, ¿no es cierto?, cuál es la oferta de formación que existe. En fin, hay un conjunto de nuevas responsabilidades que aluden a este nuevo rol de líderes educativos. Lo mismo ocurre con un segmento muy específico, que son, ¿no es cierto?, los profesores y profesoras nobeles, que por de pronto, ¿no es cierto?, empiezan por ahora recién con la nueva carrera a ser reconocidos como docentes que requieren un apoyo especial en este periodo crítico de los primeros años de trabajo en las aulas. Periodo crítico, para ponerlo dramáticamente, porque el 40%, según una investigación de la Universidad de Chile, de los docentes nuevos que se están incorporando a nuestro sistema, el 40% a los cinco años ya ha desertado a la profesión. Estamos hablando de ese nivel de criticidad. Bueno, y es claro que más allá del trabajo que quizás no hicieron del todo bien las universidades al formar esos alumnos como futuros docentes, hay también una responsabilidad de la escuela en cómo se acompaña ese periodo crítico. Pues bien, en la nueva carrera docente se incorpora la mentoría como una actividad regular y se incorpora la responsabilidad de los directivos como quienes tienen que regular también este trabajo de mentoría hacia los nuevos docentes que se incorporan. Por lo tanto, aquí ya no hubiera pasar más eso que hemos encontrado en tantas escuelas, ¿no es cierto?, de que uno habla con docentes no y dicen, bueno, no, tuve que batirme la sola, tuve, encontré por suerte un profesor que, que me apañó, ¿no es cierto?, esa palabra que tenemos nosotros que nos ayudó, me apañó. Pero no, ahora debía ser parte muy reconocida explícitamente del trabajo de los directivos, ver, ¿no es cierto?, los profesores nobles que se están incorporando y apoyarlo en su trabajo. Y una tercera Tarea adicional que se incorpora, una nueva oportunidad que se amplía más bien, tiene que ver con el tiempo no lectivo. ¿Ya? Esta es tan antigua reivindicación del gremio docente y tan justa reivindicación de ampliar el tiempo que se está, no se está frente a aula y que pasamos, ¿no es cierto?, finalmente del 25% al 30% este año y el 2019 al 35% de tiempo no lectivo. Sin embargo, ¿cómo se va a usar ese tiempo no lectivo? ¿Cómo se garantiza de que ese tiempo sea bien utilizado, tanto individualmente como colectivamente por los docentes? Esa también es tarea del liderazgo directivo. Y déjenme decirle que las experiencias que ya hemos revisado algunas de municipios que han adelantado esta medida, es decir, que ya tienen 35, 65, no son alentadoras. En general, cuando uno va a esas escuelas, lo que se encuentra es que los profesores declaran que les ocurre lo mismo que ocurría cuando había un 25% de tiempo no lectivo. La misma sensación de agobio, el no, la no posibilidad ni hábito de trabajar en la escuela, las, las reuniones de consejos de profesores siguen siendo del mismo calibre, la llevada de tareas y de planificaciones para la casa, para las noches y los fines de semana sigue siendo algo pan de todos los días, entonces, bueno, esta enorme inversión, porque es enorme que hace el país en aumentar su tiempo no electivo, ¿cómo se asegura que efectivamente rinda sus frutos? Ahí también está el trabajo del directivo escolar y el liderazgo. Esto es para darle ejemplos, ¿no es cierto? Decir, bueno, aquí hubo un cambio de giro respecto al trabajo del directivo que lo hace cada vez más desafiante, más complejo y al mismo tiempo más entusiasmante desde el punto de vista de los resultados que puede lograr. Resultados, por lo demás, que cada vez están más documentados en la literatura internacional, en la investigación y en las políticas que se están haciendo en otros países. En ese sentido, es que nosotros como Centro de Desarrollo del Liderazgo Educativo queremos contribuir con nuestro granito de arena a ir haciendo que el trabajo de potenciar el liderazgo sea cada vez más potente. Y el centro tiene distintos ámbitos, no solo tiene distintas universidades públicas y privadas en Santiago y en otras regiones del país, como se decía, sino que también hay distintas líneas de trabajo. Una es la investigación, que es muy importante, porque eso nos va a permitir tener conocimiento de nuestra realidad respecto de qué es lo que ocurre con la dirección escolar. También hay programas de formación, también hay programas innovativos y también estamos haciendo algo que nos importa mucho, que es la transferencia de capacidades a universidades en otros lugares de Chile donde no hay ni una formación de directivo. Y esto lo estamos haciendo básicamente con universidades del norte del país. 
Porque aquí, ¿no es cierto?, lo que solemos ocurrir es que los directivos tienen diplomados, muchos tienen magíster y así por delante. Y nos faltan algunos que se aventuran con doctorados incluso. Pero lo que vemos en las universidades del norte del país es que esas oportunidades no existen. Y por lo tanto nosotros estamos trabajando con universidades del norte para que esas universidades ofrezcan también ese tipo de oportunidades a los directivos de esas regiones. Rompiendo además la lógica de la competencia entre las universidades por una lógica de cooperación. Entendiendo que este es un desafío país, que si queremos mejorar nuestra educación, entre otras cosas, tenemos que también mejorar muy fuertemente el liderazgo en nuestra educación. Y que esa es una vía rápida, una vía potente para efectivamente mejorar la calidad de lo que hacemos. Dentro de estas actividades del CEDLE que les contaba, adicionalmente a eso, nos hemos propuesto el debate y el, el traer conocimiento, experiencia internacional a Chile. Intentar traer todos los años distintos exponentes que nos pongan al día de lo que está ocurriendo en el mundo, de lo que se sabe sobre estas materias. El año pasado lo hicimos, ¿no es cierto?, con Rick Mintro, con, Re con Rebecca Cheung, con Judy Guarien Little, tres destacados profesores de la Universidad de California, Berkeley, que es una de las universidades socias del CEDLE. Este año lo hacemos con el profesor Christopher Day, de la Universidad de Nottingham, una autoridad mundial en esta materia en el tema del liderazgo. Y adicionalmente a eso, y yo creo que muy complementario para su enfoque, también una autoridad mundial en el tema de la formación de docentes y el análisis del tema propiamente docente. El profesor Dey ha trabajado múltiples, en muchos ámbitos el tema, como ustedes van a ver, del liderazgo. Pero al que nosotros más nos llamó la atención es la inclusión del aspecto emocional dentro del tema del liderazgo, el aspecto de la dimensión más subjetiva de su trabajo como un tema relevante. Por eso ustedes van a escuchar en su exposición palabras como resiliencia, van a escuchar conceptos como confianza, como elementos que forman parte del trabajo central. Del... Y ojo, que el profesor Day no deja de abandonar, no abandona nunca, perdón, el foco en mejorar la formación de los alumnos como tema esencial del trabajo del directivo. Pero dice, para eso, junto a las capacidades y a las competencias en lo técnico-pedagógico, en nuestra palabra, se requiere también un trabajo en lo emocional, en lo afectivo, tremendamente relevante para poder sacarle partido a una comunidad profesional y para poder lograr que efectivamente los docentes, ¿no es cierto?, hagan una diferencia en sus salas de clase. Por lo tanto, ustedes van a ver, ¿no es cierto?, vamos a tener esa posibilidad de compartir con un académico de rango mayor que tiene, ¿no es cierto?, este rango, esta amplitud en su trabajo muy amplia de tipos de temas que ha investigado. Yo les nombraba, por ejemplo, esos dos respecto a los directivos, pero también el profesor Day, por ejemplo, ha estudiado respecto a los docentes, lo que es la trayectoria profesional de los docentes. Es decir, cómo uno puede estudiar dentro de los docentes lo que es el inicio de la carrera, como yo les nombraba con respecto a los mentores, que ahora no es cierto, podemos que empezar a trabajar con los profesores nobeles, pero él también ha hecho toda la trayectoria y ha estudiado cómo, no es cierto, dentro de 30, 40, 50 años de vida profesional, no es cierto, los docentes van perdiendo, renovando, cambiando sus energías, cambiando la manera de trabajar, nuevos roles que pueden asumir y así por delante. Algo que también deberíamos estudiar, por cierto, en el caso de los directivos. El profesor Day ha tenido la amabilidad, la energía, la vitalidad para acompañarnos en una suerte de pequeño tour por Chile. ¿ya? Como ustedes pueden ver ahí, ¿no es cierto? Esto partió en Temuco a principios de la semana. Ayer estuvimos en Talca, bajo un diluvio. ¿ya? Y hoy día, ¿no es cierto?, estamos en Santiago. Y esto corresponde a un esfuerzo nuestro muy genuino de que las cosas no queden aquí en la, nuestra capital. De asumir de verdad este tema de que Santiago no es Chile, que nos gusta muchas veces como eslóganes, pero que no lo practicamos mucho. Y por lo tanto estamos haciendo un esfuerzo con los distintos invitados internacionales, pero también con las distintas experiencias, a que también vayan al sol. Y déjenme decirles, porque yo creo que es importante que como santeguinos tomemos conciencia de esto, de que cuando se va a estas otras regiones que la metropolitana, el entusiasmo, el interés, el agradecimiento a que estas cosas no queden solo acá para nosotros, es gigantesco. 
Y ese cariño lo pudimos sentir también, creo, esta semana con el profesor Day. Quiero pedirles entonces para su, su introducción y su trabajo, ¿no es cierto?, durante esta mañana, gran atención, intentar sacar el máximo de provecho, tomar siempre estas experiencias internacionales como algo que hay que aprender para hacer las cosas mejor, más ampliamente, pero de ninguna manera para copiar. Aquí no hay recetas y no puede haber recetas porque la realidad de cada escuela es distinta. Ya nos contaba la gente en Temuco la realidad de las escuelas interculturales y cómo trabajar, ¿no es cierto?, muchas veces profesores que no eran mapuches con niños mapuches y la dificultad que eso tenía. Por lo tanto, cuando hacemos este esfuerzo de conocer lo que está pasando en el mundo es para reinterpretarlo a la luz de que lo que cada uno hace. No hacerlo sería un acto de ignorancia y de arrogancia de parte nuestra. Pero tampoco que nadie se engañe, aquí no se vienen a buscar las recetas, porque esas recetas no existen. Y cuando uno escucha al profesor Day se da cuenta que muchas de las búsquedas que nosotros estamos involucradas son búsquedas que también se están haciendo en otros lugares del mundo. Él actualmente, para que dimensionen el trabajo internacional que realiza, él está haciendo su trabajo en Inglaterra, como siempre, en la Universidad de Nottingham. Adicionalmente a eso, está trabajando en China, en Beijing, y está trabajando en Australia, en Sydney. Y por lo tanto, tiene ese rango también, yo decía rango de temas, pero también rango de mirada de lo que está ocurriendo en el mundo. Y créanme que muchos de los dilemas que nosotros nos tenemos son también dilemas que ahí se, se tienen. Así que les quiero pedir un aplauso muy especial para el profesor Day por esta mañana. Muchas gracias. Bien, agradecemos eh, la palabra del director del CEDLE. Como ustedes ya lo saben, el CEDLE lleva bastante tiempo trabajando. Por lo mismo, a continuación, les vamos a presentar un video que resume precisamente el primer año de vida del CEDLE. Atención. Somos CEDLE, Centro de Desarrollo Somos de Liderazgo CEDLE. Educativo, centro de desarrollo. un centro académico orientado a desarrollar el liderazgo de los equipos directivos y de los niveles intermedios, conformado por la Universidad Diego Portales, Universidad Alberto Hurtado, Universidad de Talca y Universidad Católica de Temuco, junto a la Escuela de Graduados de Educación de la Universidad de California, Berkeley. Nacimos en enero de 2016 a través de una invitación del Ministerio de Educación e inspirados en los casos de éxito de países como Inglaterra, Canadá y Australia. Desarrollamos una metodología de trabajo sustentada bajo cinco pilares fundamentales. La visión de los directivos como agentes de cambio y mejoramiento escolar. El liderazgo distribuido entre los miembros de una comunidad educativa. La integración sistemática del conocimiento. El desarrollo de capacidades formativas ser el referente nacional en políticas de fomento del liderazgo escolar. Hoy queremos compartir la experiencia de nuestro primer año de vida. Bajo esta guía, nos trazamos objetivos a cuatro años plazo y dentro de cuatro líneas principales de trabajo. Investigación y políticas. Innovación y desarrollo de modelos y prácticas. Formación y desarrollo de estrategias formativas. Desarrollo de capacidades e instituciones formadoras. Y a lo largo del año, realizamos seminarios, talleres, conferencias online, cursos y diplomados. Y tuvimos seis invitados internacionales. Desarrollamos un seminario internacional junto a expertas de UC Berkeley y cuatro talleres nacionales en alianza con expertos en liderazgo escolar. También llevamos a cabo proyectos editoriales, publicando tres cuadernos técnicos y el primer libro de la serie Liderazgo Educativo. Estamos comprometidos con la calidad de la educación chilena y esperamos contribuir al desarrollo del liderazgo educativo para así tener mejores escuelas y liceos en nuestro país. Somos CEDLE, Centro de Desarrollo. Bien, ahí estaba entonces lo que se ha hecho durante este primer año de vida del CEDLE para dar por lo menos una introducción al Centro de Desarrollo Educativo. Antes de dar comienzo entonces con esta conferencia e invitar a nuestro eh, invitado internacional, entiendo que ustedes en eh, la carpeta que se les entregó en la mesa de acreditación tienen una hoja, esa hoja ustedes la pueden ocupar para re realizar preguntas para nuestro invitado internacional, esas preguntas se van a responder luego 
en esta especie de foro panel que vamos a realizar al final de la presentación de nuestro invitado internacional. Así que les invitamos a escribir sus preguntas. Luego parte de la producción va a ir retirando estas preguntas para hacerlas al final de la presentación. Voy a ir entonces con una pequeña introducción de nuestro invitado internacional para esta conferencia del doctor Christopher Day. Él es profesor emérito de Educación de la Facultad de Ciencias Sociales de la Universidad de Nottingham y coordinador del Centro de Investigación sobre Liderazgo y Gestión de la Educación. Durante los últimos 20 años ha dirigido y sigue liderando proyectos de investigación y desarrollo en su país, Europa y también a nivel internacional en las áreas de educación y también liderazgo escolar. Sus intereses se centran en la calidad de la enseñanza, también el liderazgo escolar, mejoramiento y también la efectividad. Y dentro de estos, comprender cómo las escuelas, las redes escolares y las universidades pueden proporcionar una gestión y un apoyo eficaz para el desarrollo profesional y también el bienestar y la eficacia a lo largo, de los, eh, a lo largo o a largo plazo de los eh, docentes y directivos a través de la investigación y también de la enseñanza. En el día de hoy nos va a acompañar acá en la Universidad Diego Portales con la conferencia denominada, como ustedes ya lo pueden ver ahí, ¿Cómo liderar escuelas vulnerables? Aprendizajes para directivos escolares desde la experiencia internacional. Sin más eh, preámbulos entonces, vamos a recibir con un cálido aplauso al doctor Christopher Day. Buenos días. No. Buenos días. Bien. Well, you can probably see that although maybe I only look um, 80 years old or 90 years old, actually from the introduction I'm 200 years old. <laughs> you can also see that I love travel. <laughs> so I spend my life on in the air. Um, and probably uh, some of that is true, but hopefully not all is true. Um, what is true is that I began my life as a classroom teacher, I trained as a teacher, and I still love teaching. Do you love teaching? Yes. Yes, yes, good. Even though over there, do you love teaching? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's Friday morning. Uh, it, uh, is this elective or non-elective time? <laughs> okay. Um, and I say this at the beginning because the most important people in Chile, of course, are not in this room. Uh, some, most of them will be in the school. I'm talking about children and young people. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Um, that's why... I hope that most of us love what we do. Do most of you, do you love what you do? Yeah. Mm. Still not enough. <laughs> okay, and I know some of you will not be teaching children and young people at the moment. Some of you will not be principals at the moment. Some of you will be uh, more experienced principals, some less experienced principals. So we have a great mix here today. Uh, and so for me, uh, in thanking Jose for the invitation to continue to travel, <laughs> even when in a different country, uh, to thank him for the invitation, I think it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege for me. I feel it's a privilege to share. Uh, I feel it's a privilege that you've given your time to listen to what I have to say. So I'm going to do my best to make sure that what I have to say will be useful for you. Um, and, well, I hope it is. <laughs> If not, you can tell me so afterwards. But please don't walk out during the, during the presentation. <clears throat> Now, there's one or two things I have to say. Because I've been allowed to travel, because I've met other uh, groups of principals and technical directors and so on, I've been able to observe one or two things in general about them. Probably I've talked to maybe 600 now, uh, and then another 200 or more here, so it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Um, and we have several things in common, those people in Talca and so on, and I think you and I also. 
Um, we're passionate about what we do. We've already established that. What we haven't said yet is that we work very long hours. What we haven't said yet is that the job we do is draining sometimes of the energy we bring to that job. And that's particularly true in schools which serve vulnerable or what we call disadvantaged communities. It's not that principals and others in those schools, it's not that they're too different in their passion and in their um, hope for education, in their insistence that all children and young people should have an equal opportunity in education. It's not that they're so different, you're so different from principals in schools in less challenging communities. But what is true is that not only to be at your best and to do well, and this applies to the teachers in your school, of course, um, not only uh, do you need those values, those qualities, and those skills that those others in other schools have, but sometimes you need different ones, and sometimes you need more. For example, Jose mentioned resilience. It's not too hard to imagine that if you're working in a challenging school, in a challenging context, maybe you need to have more reserves of resilience than those who work in less challenging schools challenging schools. And so I'm going to share some of the, um, my own research, but particularly the research of colleagues across the world. And I'm, I'm very lucky to meet people in different schools, in different countries, speaking different languages. Um, but I'm particularly interested in those who work in disadvantaged communities or serve disadvantaged communities. And partly that's my own biography. Partly uh, that's because when I was at school, I was a failure, more or less. Um, so unlike many of my colleagues who work in universities, who have only experienced success in their work, in their lives, I've experienced failure also. Actually, I continue to experience failure too, because I can never quite reach, and this will be the same for many of you here, I can never quite reach the expectations and the hopes I have for my own work um, with people like yourselves, or in your case, with the teachers in your school and with the children and with the community that your school serves. So we're all here, I hope, determined to remain lifelong learners. Determined that our teachers, even those who have become a little cynical, maybe you have some skeptical, cynical teachers in your schools, maybe, Maybe you have some tired teachers in your schools. Maybe you have some teachers who perhaps do their best, but it's not good enough for the children. Maybe you have some teachers in your schools who don't even do their best. And there may be good reasons for that. So always when I'm thinking, always when I'm conducting my research, always when I'm in schools, and I go to many schools, and, uh, and, and that's the privilege, and uh, listen to what teachers have to say and listen where I can understand the language to what children and young people have to say. Uh, and so I know that not all children, for example, well, you know better than I do, that not all children and young people are anxious to be in school every day. Is this true? Yes, yes. Even in some cases, it's hard to believe, I know, but even in some cases, some teachers are not anxious to be in school every day. Is that right? Is that true? Yes? Uh, and so your job, you know your job, is to help those teachers recognize that there is a need in those children, a continuing need in those children and young people and the communities from which they are drawn to be taught by teachers who always teach to their best who always teach well. And in a way, that's the wonderful, the wonderful responsibility that you have. Uh, directly sometimes with the teachers and indirectly with the children and young people in your schools. It's a wonderful, as, as, a, as a cousin of mine once said, recently said to me in an email actually received this morning, uh, we were talking about a research project on uh, mental health 
of children in disadvantaged circumstances. We were talking about uh, a project which we're doing with um, the National Health Service in England, looking at the, um, at the relationship between physical activity in children and young people and motivation and engagement in learning. Interesting. So that, that these things are not separate, but together. And I just happened to say, oh, uh, and he said, oh, can you come to a meeting in two weeks or three weeks? I said, I think I can. I'll just check on that. I'm in Chile at the moment, and next week I'll be in China. <laughs> and he emailed back and said, awesome, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, well, sometimes it's wonderful, especially when you wake up here in Santiago in the morning uh, for the first time in one week in this place to see blue skies and the mountains and the snow on the mountains. Wonderful. Now you'll be thinking, well, this man here is just telling us stories. <laughs> He's being anecdotal. Well, of course I'm being anecdotal. Of course, because the story of good teaching is important. And Jose said a little earlier, as part of the introduction, he, he said to you, well, um, that I am very interested in the emotional aspects of teaching and leadership. Well, of course. Why am I interested in the, both the intellectual, the academic, and the emotional? Well, because teaching is an emotional as well as an intellectual job, isn't it? Leadership is an emotional as well as an intellectual job, isn't it? Where is the program to help you in your emotional development? Where is the program in your own school to acknowledge that teaching is an emotional uh, act, an emotional process? If you don't attract the students, if you don't engage the students, if you don't if they don't recognize that you care about each one of them in the classroom, then it's unlikely that they will learn as much as, as they would otherwise. So teachers at their best have to be, have to exercise what we call the head, what we call the hand. The head is the intellect, the hand is the competences in the classroom, and of course, the heart. And good teaching and teaching at its best, good leadership and leadership at its best, requires not just the knowledge, not just the competences, but also the emotional, some people will call it emotional understanding, emotional literacy, emotional intelligence, Daniel Goleman would say. They're a little different, but basically they're all saying the same thing. And of course, because you invest, this word invest, Again, it was used in a different context by Jose. The government is investing in improving the educational system. But actually, the most important person in that system, except for the child, except for the teacher, is you. OK? So you are every day investing. And in a way, it doesn't matter what the government does, what any government does, in terms of its reform. It can improve the system. It can contribute to improving the conditions in the system. It can suggest, even mandate, changes in the way teachers teach. It can mandate changes in the qualifications that teachers have. It can encourage you, the important you, uh, to attend seminars and programs and so on. But actually, it can't be in your school. It can't be in your classrooms. Sometimes it can't even be in your district. So there's a limit to what the government can do. Good, bad, indifferent, there is always a limit. That's why you're the most important. Because you are there in your school, you are able to influence every day. And you know, uh, people come and people go. My job here is to try to influence you. But in one and a half hours, we'll be, we won't be together again. And maybe you'll remember one thing. Maybe you'll remember two things. Maybe you won't remember anything. But I can't do anything about that. So you are the most important person for your school and for your teachers. And now I'm going to start my presentation. <laughs> In a moment, anyway. Let me just make sure that I've said everything I wanted to say. Yes. OK, good. So. I'm going to talk about um, successful leadership in schools in challenging contexts. 
And I'm going to refer to some government reports, some international government reports like OECD. I'm going to refer to some empirical research by people in different countries. And I'm going to refer to um, research by myself and my colleagues where it is relevant to this theme. So in 2014, according to the OECD, the challenge for Chile, for Chile, and Chile has taken that challenge, I believe, under this government, so congratulations to Chile until the next election anyway. We'll see what happens. Um, raising the status of teaching. <laughs> yes, it's problematic, isn't it? In every country. Because we have to remember that politicians are elected for three or four or five years, and then maybe no longer. So if you're an ambitious politician, everything you want to achieve has to be achieved in that period. If you're an ambitious school principal, you have a little longer to achieve what you want to achieve. So raising the status of teaching by reshaping teacher career pathways. I'll talk a little bit about teacher career pathways as we progress this morning. Remedying the shortage of qualified teachers. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the qualifications, but also the qualities of teachers uh, a little later. And you'll hear me say, you'll hear me give some figures uh, about the quality of teachers that are recruited for schools in dis serving disadvantaged communities. And you'll hear me be a little pessimistic about that. And it, it won't just apply to Chile it will apply to uh, many other countries also. And then, as Jose said earlier, reducing the high attrition rates that hinder the ability of schools to provide quality instruction. Now, I am aware that I think for most of you, if not all of you, you don't have a choice. You cannot appoint the staff who teach in your school. Is that right? So your job is even harder than the job of principals in countries who do have the power to appoint the teachers in their school. Uh, and so I remember that as we, as we move along in this, in this presentation. Now, I've been talking now for, I think, 10 minutes at the very least. So I want to do a reality check. You know, reality check is, you know. So I just want to ask you briefly at the moment, is what I'm saying so far, does it have some relevance to you at the moment? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, who said C? Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Now I have a supporter. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So, so there are challenges in schools. Uh, the lecture itself, you can see, is divided in two, thank you very much, is divided into uh, seven parts, including the conclusions. I'm going to spend less time on parts one, two, and three, and more time on parts four, five, and six, because really that will be the most, I think, relevant uh, for you. But you, can, you will tell me that. Okay. So first of all, then, leadership challenges, external contexts and their implications for change. Now, every principal in every school um, has to deal with external uh, contexts. Every principal in every school has to deal with change. You can come in. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, you can come in. And sometimes we forget that in the everyday busyness of life in schools, the reality, if you like, of life in schools, sometimes we forget that we are all, all of us in this room, quite explicitly, we're in the business of change. Because if we're in the business of learning, we have to be in the business of change. Because learning implies change. And so sometimes, we don't have the opportunity to reflect on, well, exactly what change do we want to happen in our schools? You know, before the question, how do we want to achieve it, we need to know what's the vision? What are the values we want to promote? We want to communicate. We want to fashion, if you like, in our schools. And they may be the same or they may be different. And as you reflect on this, and I hope you will reflect throughout this brief um, uh, lecture, uh, just reflect on, if I came to your school, 
or if a stranger came to your school and they spoke to you and they said to you, well, can you tell me about the values and the vision for the school in terms of the education of the students and possibly the education of the community even in your school? And you told me, and I said, well, I'd like to talk to some teachers. And then I was introduced to some teachers. And I said, I asked the same question to those teachers. And one teacher said, oh, I'm not quite sure. And another teacher said, this is the value here. But it was a different value than the one you had told me about. I would be worried about the quality of, and the vision and the values in your school. I'd be worried about calling your school a professional, for example, a professional learning community. I would be a little, I would question. I said, well, what's the first job of a principal? Well, the first job of a principal, an effective principal, is to ensure that the vision and the values throughout the school, first of all, are agreed by all who work in the school, and secondly, are carried out in the classrooms. You can see the values, you can see the vision in the way teachers work with children, the relationships they have with children, the relationships they have with each other, the relationships you have with the teachers, and important, 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 the relationships you have with your community, with your parents. Particularly important for all schools, but particularly important for those schools which serve um, disadvantaged communities. And part of the Part of the reason that principals get tired, some principals get very tired, but all principals get tired. Part of the reason for this is that their work is a little different from the teachers. Teachers will get tired, teachers will get inspired, teachers will uh, feel the pain, but also feel the pleasure of working with children or young people in their classrooms. But that's their job is to do that. Your job is not only to make sure that the teachers work well and to their best with children and young people in the classrooms, but you also have to work with the government or the municipality. You have to work with the parents and the community. In other words, your job is more complex. It's not necessarily more important, although I think it is, um, but it's more complex. And so it's not surprising because of the many interactions which you have to engage in, you have to succeed in, because you, I said earlier that we're all in the business of change. Well, if you're meeting with the municipality, if you're, if you're looking at government documents, if you're meeting with parents, if you're meeting with the community, if you're meeting with social workers and educational psychologists and so on, you are still in the business of change. So you have to know how to work with these people, not only with the children and young people that your teachers have to work with, but with this variety. And this variety of, we call them stakeholders, may have different interests um, because of their jobs or because of their values. So it's a, it's, it's a complex job that you do, as you know, but it's also a challenging job. So let's, oops. So let's look at some of these um, challenges, if we can, if we can find them. First of all, the policy concerns. Well, policy concerns are the same for every country now in the world. And you can see what the two policy concerns are, and there's good reasons for those concerns. We cannot disagree. We cannot disagree that we want to develop what others, what sociologists would call human capital, in other words, the uh, uh, the best uh, of progress and the best of um, um, examination results, if you like, for our academic results for all our children, because it's important, because we're, in, we're competing in the world, the economy. We have to have uh, young people who can take jobs, who can be adaptive and so on, and who are highly qualified. That's very important, of course. Uh, but equally, it's important that all of those children contribute to the formation and the further development of a society which is less conflicted, perhaps, which is more harmonious, perhaps, in which we don't have those at the top and those at the bottom and so on. There's a more equal distribution, if you like, um, not just of wealth, but also of talent. 
And of course, you know, and again, in many countries in the world, this would be true, that uh, there's an association between the initial or pre-service training of teachers and theory. Uh, and this theory, uh, these theories are not always appreciated by practicing teachers and schools and so on and so forth. And in some countries, even governments, they say, well, you know, the work that is done in universities uh, uh, to train teachers or people who want to become teachers is uh, too theory-led. And so in my own country, for example, most of the time spent in training for most uh, pre-service or initial teacher training students is spent in schools. Of course, you would say, of course. But then on the other hand, we know that schools are quite conservative places. Uh, too busy finding solutions, not enough time to examine the problems. Because it's immediate, because teaching in the classroom has an immediacy about it. If a child is restless, if a child is misbehaving, you don't, you don't say, hmm, I wonder which of three solutions I could use to help this child concentrate. Because it's now, and that child may be interfering with the learning of others. You can see here that Chile maybe is, well, yeah, maybe then, at least a few years ago, was not doing too well in terms of equity in relation to other OECD countries. Not doing too well in terms of uh, student attainment, but is getting better. Uh, many, many countries, with very few ex uh, um, exceptions, uh, experience teacher turnover and teacher attrition. And I've just given you one example here from um, uh, Chicago in America, but you could have the similar examples in other countries too. Um, but the first sentence is the most important. Teacher turnover and attrition is driven by teachers' preferences for working with less disadvantaged students. So you remember I said earlier that it's more of a challenge for you in your school because you may have teachers there who are less well qualified than in other schools. And that makes your job a little harder. If you look positive, it's more exciting because you have a chance to shape and to influence, but it's certainly harder. I'm going to skip um, and skip to part two. I'm well known already in Chile for spending more time in my lecture than I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to try and be more efficient this morning, especially for you because it's Friday. Okay. So part two, life in schools, a different kind of, a different kind of reality than we see in government policy. And workplace conditions, well, I'm sure, and this comes from, this is a synthesis, if you like, from research in many countries. First of all, there's more pressure. There are increased expectations of teachers, of schools, and of head teachers. Is this true? Yeah, it's true. It's hard to hear you because of these fans. Would you speak a little louder, perhaps? Is it true? Oh, wonderful, yes, good, okay. Turbulent contexts, taking complex problems seriously and engaging with others in finding solutions. So we don't live uh, in a, a, a passive society, if you like. We live in a place in Chile, in England, in the USA, in Australia, where things are not equal. Uh, and this is particularly true in relation to children and young people in um, challenging contexts. But the third one is very important too, because it relates directly to you. In many countries, teachers tell us, us researchers, not just me, but other researchers in other countries, they tell us um, that um, their head teachers, their principals, are a little incognito in their leadership. They don't see them very much around the school. The principals, of course, have important administrative and bureaucratic tasks to perform, many forms to fill in, many papers to sign and read, and so on. And so their principals often remain in their offices during the day. All the research on effective school principals tells us that those effect, part of their effectiveness can be seen in their presence. We have the word presence around the school. 
And so they complete their administrative and bureaucratic tasks either before the children and young people come or after they've left. This, of course, makes the day longer for them. And we know that principals work effective principals. Yes, they work longer hours. But they do so because they're passionate, because they're committed, because they want uh, people to improve. And improvement is never enough. Do you know, even in schools which are regarded by external inspectors, for example, in some countries as successful, even in those schools, you can ask the teachers, you can ask the principal, and they will say, no, we still have more of our journey to take. We still want to do even better than it seems that we're doing. So those principals have high expectations. The teachers in the classrooms have high expectations. And we often hear in some of the critical reports of teacher stress because, again, because of the, sometimes because of the behavior in the classroom, sometimes because of the extra tasks that governments are asking them to perform, sometimes they're stressed because of the principal. You never know. Um, so, but in good schools, in effective schools, we still see teachers who are stressed. But that stress is more positive. They say, yes, we are stressed, and we're receiving support from our principals and from others, and we don't mind being, and our families, and we don't mind being stressed because we can see that the children and the young people are benefiting from what we're doing. That's why we're here. It's an interesting um, dichotomy, really. We're stressed, but we want to continue to be stressed because we can see that we're making a difference, making a positive difference with the children. Okay. Um, so, and the rest you can read for yourself. But the last one I'll talk a little bit more about later is the emotional resilience, you can see, and moral purpose. And the workplace conditions continue. Under or poorly qualified teachers, excessive workload. Look at the average in the OECD and you'll see that teachers in Chile work more hours than the average. And you can say that, therefore, it might be that those conditions make the work a little more stressful for them. And that means that your job is more complicated. Because your job is not with children and young people. Your job is with your teachers. You're, you are mainly responsible for the culture of the school, how we do things around here, who we are around here, as some people have, have said, um, and for establishing the conditions by which teachers are motivated to teach well and to their best. Because it's the teachers who are with, them every, with the children every day. Rapid pace and uncertainties of change, uh, pupil diversity and behavior. Let's not forget that at the end of every day, if you work in a school serving a disadvantaged community, let's not forget that at the end of every day, the children go back into this often dysfunctional conflicted community um, from which they're drawn. And if you look at some of the quantitative research, for example, um, in different countries, you can see that around about 50%, they say, of the influence on children and young people's learning is in those communities, because that's where they spend most of their time, from their peers and from their adults and, and the norms and the values of those communities. And so already you're fighting in a school serving a disadvantaged community. Actually, it's more exciting, it's more challenging, but you know you can't solve all the problems, but you still try, don't you? Yes. And no one else in the school is responsible, more responsible than you, for having hope, for communicating hope in the school. You're the one person in the school who cannot go in in the morning and say, I'm not interested in my job today. <laughs> you cannot. Can, you can't, can you? Really, you can't. Uh, even if you don't feel you're interested in your job, you cannot. And that will be catastrophic for the staff and ultimately for the children and, um, and young people. And uh, I was working uh, with a, an elementary school an urban elementary school serving a highly disadvantaged community in my own, uh, one of the university towns in Nottingham. 
And I was working with a new head teacher there who'd been a deputy principal before, and she'd come into this school, and she turned this school around. And I may tell you a little more about that later, if we have the, if we have the time. But the teachers in that school, when I was interviewing them, and I, was, I went uh, in that school regularly for three or four years, because it was a fascinating case study of change and improvement and engagement and inclusion. And when that principal began in that school, <coughs> she uh, inherited a school which had very few resources, many windows broken, hypodermic needles in the playground. It was a drug culture in the community, a uh, very highly emotionally dysfunctional community, gun crime in the community. And within one year, uh, there were no more broken windows, there were no more hypodermics, and the community supported that school, which made a big difference. Uh, she changed many things, including, of course, the teaching. But I may tell you more about that later. But for now, the point I want to make uh, is that those teachers in that school, incidentally, she did not choose those teachers. When she went into that school, she inherited those teachers who had experienced failure. And four years later, the same teachers were there, most of the same, not all, but most of the same teachers were still there experiencing success. That's the kind of influence you can have on your teachers, even if you haven't appointed them. And when I was speaking and listening to these teachers, this is, this is what they were telling me. They were saying, well, we do, we commit our whole selves to this job. But every day when the children come back after being with their families, perhaps running drugs and so on, uh, with their elder siblings, every day we have to start again. Every day. And that's different from schools which serve less disadvantaged communities. Those schools do not, with most of their children, have to start again every day. And I can tell you of another school, and in another uh, disadvantaged, serving another disadvantaged community um, uh, in which the teachers praised the work of their principal. And they praised the work of their principal not for their administrative skills, not for their management skills, but for their leadership skills and their leadership qualities. And in particular, the individualized support which that principal emotional support, which that principal was able to give to the teachers when they needed it, to help to continue to restore or build the capacity that those teachers had to work emotionally and academically in the classroom, for which, of course, they needed reserves of resilience. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, if we have time. So that's why here, in the bottom of that slide, I've, talked, I've used the words possibilities of diminished commitment, disengagement, reduced capacity for resilience, and of course, in the extreme, we have the burnout. And if we have the burnout and the teacher is still in the classroom, I'm sorry for the children. I'm sorry for the teacher. And if we have the burnout and the teacher is ill and cannot come to school, I'm sorry for the teacher and I'm sorry for the children. And so what we must do if we're to be successful is not only to keep children coming to the school, because of course, if they don't come, they're not learning, uh, but also keep them engaged in the learning once we get them into the school. And to be engaged in learning means you need a teacher who is engaged with you in that learning. You know that, don't you? Yeah. One voice only over here. You know that, don't you? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Good. Another supporter over there. Excellent. Good. So, um, what, we're, what we're seeing as a worldwide phenomenon, and it's different in different countries, it moves at different paces, but it's always in the same direction. So it affects you, it affects people in China, it affects people in uh, Australia or Africa, wherever you go, is the move in schools is an acknowledgement that it's not enough if you want to be effective. It's not enough to be a manager. You have to be a leader. 
Now, if you're a good leader, you're also, you also need to be a good manager. But to be a good manager only does not imply that you're a good leader. In fact, the reverse, really. Um, so the movement in all countries in training of principles, whether it's initial training of principles or induction or uh, renewal of experienced principles, values and work, is changing the patterns of roles um, as managers to leaders of what we call leaders of learning. So it's not enough that you have a technical director in your school who, who is responsible for the learning. Actually, you have to be responsible for the learning with that technical director. And being responsible means knowing about the different ways in which learning can occur so that it will benefit the students. So it's a knowledge of, and it's an appreciation of, if you like. And again, this can be passed to the teachers in different ways. And so it's transformational and instructional leadership. Now, there'll be some of you in this room who are familiar with those terms and some who may not. Uh, just to say, uh, for those who are not familiar with those terms, what we do know from empirical, mixed methods empirical research in uh, Australia, in America, and in my own country, um, large-scale research, what we do know is that effective principles do not adopt particular theoretical models of leadership. They actually, they demonstrate uh, different aspects, a synergy, if you like, between different aspects of those. But what we do know is that the business, the core business of schools is teaching and learning and achievement, uh, and that principles cannot help those core, uh, that core business expand and increase and improve unless they have uh, the necessary values, vision, and interpersonal relationships. And if Jose had talked a little longer, he would have mentioned trust. Uh, or as the sociologists would say, social capital, when we talk about capacity building. And many of you will know from your own experience in your schools both as teachers before you became principals and so on, you will know the value of uh, a trust between teacher and teacher, between teacher and child, between teacher and parent, and between principal and teacher. And you will know that where there is trust, it can act in two ways. It can act as a glue to keep people together, sometimes against the forces of the outside world sometimes. But it can also act as a lubricant, something which allows you to talk to each other and not have to take notes and say, well, did we agree on this one month ago at our meeting? <laughs> you know, this is less important than the, if you like, partly the benevolence, partly the um, understanding uh, that, that you have with your teachers and parents and community and so on, if you can grow trust and trust is not easy to grow. And some of you will know that trust is very easy to go, to leave. It doesn't take much sometimes. Because the work that you do is complicated, and we get tired, and so on. OK. So I want to move on. Governments are concerned with retention. We'd all like our best teachers to stay with us in our school. But actually, no, we wouldn't. We'd like all our teachers to stay in their school, in our schools, provided that they were able to and willing to teach to their best and well, what we call quality retention. It's not enough to put people in front of children or young people in schools. We have to put people who are willing and able to teach to their best and well in front of those children. So it's the quality. Now, I think, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the work that I and others have done on uh, teachers' work and lives, and variations in teachers' work and lives. And you know, sometimes, maybe you know some of these people, maybe even you have experienced this in your uh, career life. There are some people who begin teaching with a passion, with a commitment, and five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, somehow that passion has become eroded. 
Sometimes it's forgotten. Yeah? There are people who begin to teach with a commitment to their own learning. And yet, for some of them, five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years later, they're not interested in their learning. They're only interested in the children or the young people's learning. It's what someone called many years ago a toxic school, where a school only recognizes the value of learning of pupils, but fails to recognize the complementary value of learning for the adults in that school. And learning, of course, never ends, does it? That's why you're here today. That's why I do research, that's why we do research. That's why I'm able to, uh, to travel and visit other schools, because I learn from this, we learn from this. Teachers who don't learn, who have stopped learning, are not doing any favors for the children and young people they teach. And we talk about, some people talk about continuous learning. I disagree. On a Friday afternoon, this afternoon, this week, this afternoon, when you get home, do you really want to continue to be learning? Or would you rather have a glass of wine? Or watch TV? <laughs> There's the answer. So we can talk about continuing learning. That's OK, because it allows us to have breaks. At least consciously, we can have breaks. We can even sleep if we like. And we don't expect that we will learn when we sleep. Yeah. Now, it's a partly a, a, a humorous point, but also partly a serious point. Because if you agree that life in your schools is um, complex and hard, sapping your energy, and that of your teachers, then part of professional development, part of continuing professional development, is to build time in, in some ways, so that teachers can relax. Not that so they continue to work hard. They can relax in a different way. Maybe they can read an article. Maybe that's part of professional development. Now, we said earlier that your teachers in Chile work long hours. And Jose mentioned earlier that some of my work, in fact, next week I'll be in Beijing, in China. And some of my work there. And so I know a little about the conditions for teaching and learning in some Chinese schools. How many hours do you think they work? I won't ask you. It's a rhetorical question. How many hours a week do you think Chinese teachers in, in schools work? Well, it could be 11 or it could be 12. 11 or 12 with the children, with the young people in classrooms. Now, of course, they work for 25 or 35 more hours. But with the children in the classroom, like your teachers, like teachers in England, we are the same. Maybe 25 hours in the classroom. So what do they do with the rest of the time? Of course, there is a surplus of teachers in China. So we're not worrying about attrition or loss of teachers, no. And they're all civil servants, so that's another. Uh, so they all have quite high status, not quite low status, as many teachers in many countries uh, do. What do they do with this other 10 or 12 or more hours each week? Do they go home? No. No. Do they work with other teachers? Yes. Do they run clubs and societies, not non-academic sometimes for the children? Yes, they do. Do they read? Yes. Do you know that every teacher in China must, is it, sorry, is expected to write and publish something about their teaching? It's not a big tome, it's not huge, but th there's an expectation that they will, in other words, that they will be able to reflect on what they do and why they do it on a regular basis. Now, there are other things not so good about China, of course, uh, but I'm just telling you that it's not the same in every country. And where was this thing? Have any of you heard of lesson study? Anyone? Lesson study? No? No? Okay. Well, lesson study is something very simple, and it originated in Japan, and it's widely practiced as part of professional development in China. And it's being taken up in many other countries now. And it's very, very simple. There's nothing very, very simple. Um, two or three teachers get together, and one of those teachers 
plans their lesson. The other two teachers may help them or may just listen to the planning. And then those two teachers go and watch that one teacher teaching. And then after that one teacher has taught, the three of them get together and they talk about the teaching in relation to the purposes of the lesson and so on. Uh, and then they help to plan the next one. And then the second teacher does the same and the third teacher does the same. So they're sharing. So if we talk about capacity building, if we talk about social capital, if we talk about trust, if we talk about professional learning and development, what could be more simple than that, really? And I can hear some of you say, oh, but well, we don't have time to do this. Actually, you don't have time not to do this. If you want your teachers to reflect on what they do so that they can do it better. That's the whole reason. Yeah? And it doesn't matter if for half an hour or one hour, two classes are put together, for example. Those children are not going to suffer. Their lives are not going to be shattered. If one teacher teaches, if you like, a double group, uh, you know how many uh, in, in many classes in Chinese schools there are 40 or 50 students. Yeah. So again, different, but very interesting. And one of the, one of the, um, one of the most important things we're told about effective leaders, I'll talk about shortly, uh, is not just that the key dimensions are acknowledged, are recognized uh, of effective leadership, but of those key dimensions, the most important one, research tells us, is promoting and engaging in professional learning and development. Right. So of all the, the key dimensions that effective leadership, uh, that effective leaders in schools, uh, according to international uh, research, is professional leadership and uh, learning and development. I'll show you a chart a little later. Um, although we have less time now. Every time I say a little later, we have less time to be later. <laughs> Interesting. OK, so part three. What international research tells us about effective leadership? Well, I think you can tell from what I've already been reporting and sharing with you that effective leadership, of course, is essential to improve the efficiency and equity of schooling worldwide. And that's why I love talking to principals, because I know that you are the main people who are able to make a difference to the whole of your school, even perhaps to the community. That's why I love you as principals, because you have that opportunity. I love teachers because they have the opportunity to directly influence. And, and I hate those teachers who don't like doing what they're doing. I'll tell you a short, even though we haven't time, I'll tell you a short story, another anecdote, a, a short. Is it okay? Can I tell you a little story? Yes, please, somebody's saying. Oh, okay, 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 I'll tell you. Uh, I told it to the first group but not the second group this week because it seemed to be uh, relevant then but not, not the other stuff. But it's a true story. Um, and as you've already heard, I, 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 I use airports a lot. In fact, sometimes I feel I live in airports. And so, I, I, like you, when you go to a different country or a different place, you have to go through, pass through security. This is called the slow walk. The slow walk through security. So you queue, and you have your bag your small bag or something, and you're waiting, in the case of a man, to take off his jacket um, or take off his belt. Sometimes you take off your shoes, some, and so you know what happens. But it's slow. There's almost always a queue. Well, I was in one of these queues, and there was nothing else to do except listen. So I was listening, and behind me there were two voices, it, fortunately in English, so I could understand them because you know I'm very limited in my language acquisition, even though I go to different countries, I'm a terrible language learner. But these were English voices, and uh, it was, uh, they were probably young people, I thought, uh, because I didn't see who they were at the time. And um, the, uh, the, the young lady said to the young man, what are you going to do when you leave university? So then I, could, I knew immediately, they were in their final year at university. And so the young man said, well, I also knew they didn't know each other very well because otherwise, why should she be asking him this? So they were traveling together. So that was another interesting, but I, that, it's a different story. Um, and so, and so um, he said, well, I'm, I'm, going to, you know, I'm going to use my engineering degree to become an engineer. Oh, okay, small pause. 
And I thought, well. And then he asked, of course, he asked the young lady, well, what are you going to do when you leave university? And there was a small pause while she thought about this. And she said, well, I'm not really sure. But he said, well, if I can't do anything else, I'll be a teacher. Mm, yes. Think about what you would have done in that situation if you had heard someone say that. If I can't think of anything else, I'll be a teacher. What, what would you have done? What would you have thought? Well, you can reflect on this. Shall I tell you what I did? Or shall I keep it secret? No, you have to persuade me. No? Persuade me to tell you. No, 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 no. no. I'm easily persuaded, I'll tell you. OK. Without thinking. You know, sometimes you do things without thinking. And this occasion, I did it without absolute thinking. I turned around immediately. So then I saw them. And you know, in that microsecond of making a decision, that microsecond, you think, thank goodness he's not this tall and this strong. Because what? <laughs> but it was a microsecond. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't reflection, really. It was this very. And I just said, look, I, I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. Uh, and uh, I just want to say to you, looking at the young lady, I said, please, please do not become a teacher. Because the children and young people need people who want to teach them. Not who are doing it because they can't think of anything else. And then I quickly turned around again. <laughs> <laughs> and for one moment, I thought, what will, what will happen? Fortunately, nothing happened. And there was silence, absolute silence behind me. And we never made eye contact again in that slow walk through security. <laughs> So I don't know what happened. But I hope the words that I spoke made a difference to her. Um, and we should all feel strong, shouldn't we? If we're principals of schools or work in university education, we should all feel strongly about this. We do not want people in our schools who don't want to be teachers. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, but of course, the reality is, according to research, there are people who are teaching in schools who maybe now no longer want to be teachers. Even from the beginning, maybe it was a job, a means of earning a living, a means of being secure. And that makes the job of a principal even more challenging. Because for those people, those people who you inherit, your job is to influence them. Your job is to try to turn them around so after some years even, it may take time, so that then they say, oh, I'm really pleased that you are here leading this school because you have made a difference to me. Just as a child in a classroom can turn to a teacher and say, I'm really glad I've been taught by you because you have made a difference to me. It's about individual differences as well as collective differences that we make. That's why you need high levels of interpersonal skills. That's why you need what I will call professional empathy. You know, empathy is, of course, standing in someone else's shoes and understanding them, but that's not your job. Well, it's part of your job, but the other part of your job is to act upon your understanding of them. And I call that professional empathy. It's not just understanding, it's acting on the understanding which you have. So of course, you have to be a very good at diagnosing need, like, like good teachers in classrooms. You have to be very good at making decisions and taking actions at the right time, in the right place, in the right way. What a wonderful life you lead. It's terrific, isn't it, really? Even though sometimes we all make mistakes. Sometimes we don't always get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong, even. But we still continue to try like every good teacher in a classroom. OK. So as far as we're aware, according to Ken Leithard, one of the most eminent empirical researchers on uh, effective leadership in secondary schools, as far as we're aware, there's not a single documented case of a school successfully turning around its pupil achievement trajectory in the absence of talented leadership. Are you all talented leaders? 
Oh, no, no modesty then. Okay, okay, okay. Let me, let me, no, I won't ask it again. No, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. Okay. And of course, as myself and my colleagues, but many others around the world have said, school, have found that school leadership is second only to classroom teaching as an influence upon pupil learning. You already know that. So this is confirming what you already know, I think. Um, now, how do you define success? Well, what we know is that effective leaders, that is, leaders who, whose schools improve, don't only define success in terms of the growth of human capital, if you like, or a, a academic attainment, but they also define success as good citizenship, um, uh, a, sen a secure sense of identity in pupils. You know, if you teach in a school in a disadvantaged circumstances, it's likely that many of your pupils will have a very low sense of identity, very low self-efficacy, very low expectations of themselves as students in schools. Um, and so good, effective leaders focus on this. Um, okay, I've talked about that already. I've talked about that already. Are you with me? There, good. Um, this just this one just emphasizes the pedagogical leadership, which is part of effective leadership. Without an understanding of the knowledge necessary for teachers to teach well, content knowledge, general pedagogical knowledge, content-specific pedag pedagogical knowledge, curriculum knowledge, and knowledge of learners, school leaders will be unable according to Jim Spillane and C. Shaw, Karen C. Shaw Lewis, will be unable to perform essential school improvement functions such as monitoring instruction and supporting teacher development. And we know in your own country, uh, e even now as we speak, uh, there are developments in um, the means by which you can use uh, classroom observation as a tool to help teachers improve what they do, help, in other words, students in their learning through the improvement of teachers. So it underlines the importance of, ped of the knowledge of pedagogical leadership for, for all principals, not only their technical directors, if you like. And then there's a third model. Now, I'm going to show you a picture because I know that some of you already will not be listening to my words anymore. I suspect this is the case. I would probably by now have what well, I have a long blink, so my eyes might have started to close a little. I hope nobody, but you know, those people over there know that I can't see them very well. They know that. Yeah. <laughs> and it might be that that's why they chose to sit where they're sitting. <laughs> so I have not. To <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Good, good. Yes, give everybody a wave. Everybody a wave, please. Yes, thank you, thank you. Wonderful, okay. So I'm not going to be cynical about you anymore. I know that you're paying attention. I know that you're engaged. Okay. But I still think you need to see this picture. Now, this picture relates to this claim. This claim is that successful leadership requires a synergy. In other words, a combination and accumulation of different aspects, if you like, different qualities, different values, different strategies, different behaviors. And some of you may be surprised by what I'm going to show you now, but really it illustrates what head teachers, what successful head teachers who've sustained their success have told us about what they do in order to continue to achieve and work for further success in their schools. And this is what's called I'm delaying it, I'm delaying it because I want you to want to see it more. Um, <laughs> this is, I'm going to show you what's called a structural equation model. Now, all that means is that the answers to several questions by a lot of people are analyzed in using statistical techniques. And when, when you see this, you'll see that there are, well, I'm giving it away now, there are boxes there and there are lines which connect the boxes. If those lines were not statistically valid or reliable, if you like, you couldn't have this model. So you will see lines, but you'll also see some figures in, at some point in those lines. It might be, might be 0.1, it might be 0.4, it might be 0.8. But all of those relationships which you will see are statistically significant. 
some more than others, but all of them. And this is relating what you do, if you're successful, over time, in different ways, to achieve the success in your school. Oh, I wonder if I have it in this. Oh, maybe I don't have, maybe I can't, sh well, there it is, there it is, yes. Now, of course, you can reflect on this because you have it in your packs. Some of you may not be able to read this very clearly. It doesn't matter for now. But it just tells you the huge number of activities in which successful leaders engage. This is for secondary, but also is a very, very similar for primary schools. Yeah. It's a lot, isn't it? And you can also see that some... All of those boxes, incidentally, are just headlines. Behind each of those boxes, it's like a newspaper. So you're reading different headlines here. And if you want to read on, you have to look behind those boxes because there's more data, more information, if you like, there. And if you look at this uh, table here, or this structural equation model here, um, which is also known as a predictive model because, because you can construct this, it means that you can predict that successful heads will all engage in one way or another in all of those activities. Now, if you look at the line running through the middle of that whole box, uh, from, if you like, red to blue to kind of green to yellow, you'll see that's the only direct relationship that you have in what you do with uh, pupils and their uh, academic outcomes. And all of the others are indirect relationships through what you do, right? But what's interesting is, in, in that line, you can see that attendance, of course, is important. So good heads, when they arrive in the school, make sure attendance is good, and they have different strategies for that. Uh, good heads make sure that behavior is good. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, it means in practice that there are school-wide policies for behavior for learning. Some people call it behavior management. I call it behavior for learning because what's the point of behaving if you're not learning? Uh, or of changing your behavior if you're not learning. Right? So there are school-wide policies which are owned by the teachers. They have a say in it. So that when a child or a young person experiences a different teacher or moves into a different classroom, then they know that the rules for behavior are going to be consistent. And again, particularly children, young people from disadvantaged communities need stability, need consistency for their confidence, if for nothing else. You know that already. Yeah? Well, we hope. We hope. Now, you can ask yourself in your own school, just to go around, just think about walking around your school. Are pupils all treated fairly in the classroom? Or, like me, do you have a particular favorite group in the classroom? And a less favored group over there. <laughs> Although now, because you waved, you're more favored. This group over here is less favored. So I'm changing my mind because they think that because they're close, I won't look at them very much. They think that. Actually, I've always, you know, when, when, I, when I began as a teacher, you know, and I had an outside inspector come to see me teach. And he was fine, and, you know, I was doing okay. Uh, and he said, well, there's one criticism I want to make. He said, you favor the right-hand side of the classroom. And you don't favor, with your eye contact, the left-hand side of the classroom. It's funny, because I'm left-handed, so you... But no, this. But you can see that I didn't learn anything from that <laughs> inspector, because still, I'm favoring this and not this. Which brings me to a different point. It's a point about teachers. It's a point about learning from experience. Do you really believe that we all learn from experience? No. Somebody in the front row is nodding there. She believes it. Well, sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. And what, what I, the point I'm making is that in your schools, there'll be teachers who are young teachers, teachers who are in the middle of their career, if you like. Uh, to, oh, thank you very much. I'm being prompted. Um, and teachers uh, in the later phases of their career. And you also will be in the early phase of principalship, in the middle phase of principalship, in the later, maybe, some of you, phase of principalship. And in the olden days, what we used to believe, what the theory tells us, is there's a, 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 a clear line from novice, 
And still, we heard this morning, novice principles, novice teachers. From novice, which goes through to advanced beginner, which goes through to competent, which goes through to uh, proficient, and then which goes through to expert. And so that as you gain more experience, you'll pass through these stages. So that by the time that you're in your later career, you will be an expert. Well, you know in your schools there are some teachers in the later career who are not yet an expert. And there are some teachers in the middle of the career who are already experts, but in five years' time may not be because they may have stopped learning for some reason. So in other words, growth, if you like. When we talk about, thank you very much, I've got a lovely smile from somebody here. It's wonderful. You're my favorite now. <laughs> don't tell anyone else yet. OK. So, it's, it's, so it's, it, it may be that there'll be an expert teacher in year three of their work. It may be. It's interesting when you think about teaching as against other occupations. Um, teaching is the only occupation, I think, where the moment you're qualified, you're expected to do exactly the same work that somebody who's already been there for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, you're expected to manage and lead a class in their learning and achievement. And although there are 30% now, if you like, and we have it in England also, and many other countries are adopting this model where in your first year of teaching, you don't have what we call a full load, a full class load. Although that, although that is uh, now the case, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get better because you have more time to reflect. Depends on the quality of the reflection. Depends upon the quality of leadership because it will be you as principals who are, if you like, um, planning uh, what will happen in that uh, time which is now available. And if you're not planning it, you'll certainly be monitoring the effects of it and the impact of it uh, on, your, on your teachers. Okay, so you had a look. You had a look at the, that, and now I'm moving on. I'm being moved on by my boss over here uh, to four broad phases of school development. And so we're in a society, many countries now, are in a society of I want it now. Young people want it now. Older people begin to say, I want it now. I want a television now. I want a game, whatever it is. I want an iPhone 7 now. I want to go and travel now, uh, and so on. Don't keep me waiting. It's a problem for teachers. This is not part of this lecture, but elsewhere I've written, um, uh, and others have written, uh, about the, one of the difficulties for teachers in classrooms is that children and young people, because of our technology and the use of uh, social media, as well as the technology, as part of the technology, are not prepared to wait as long as they once were for good teaching, if you like, or to understand something. They would like to switch to another channel. But of course, you can't do that with one teacher in a classroom for one hour or 40 minutes. You cannot switch to another channel. But that's a different story. That's partly about the effects of, um, or the possible effects of technology on, for example, children's ability to concentrate for long periods of time. You have technology, you don't need to concentrate for long periods of time. You know, if you want to know the definition of a term, you just put it into your phone and you find the definition of a term. You don't have to look for the book. You don't have to open the book. You don't, you don't have to spend all of that time. But there's also some research. Now, I'm talking about a different talk now, but there's also, there's also some research uh, which would tell you that college students, for example, and not just children at school, if they read most of their texts on screen, read it in a different way than if they read their texts as a hard copy, if you like. They, they think about it in a different way. They're more easily distracted. They will maybe leave the text and do something else and come back to the text if it's on screen, because they can do that. More difficult, uh, if you like, with hard copy. There's some research emerging which questions uh, even the how we learn, if you like, through technology. It's not uh, the magic formula, maybe, that uh, sometimes we thought it was. Anyway, four, bra four phases of school development. Now, you, it's a good exercise for you who have been a principal for a while now to reflect upon, what, what did I do when I first came into the school? What was it like? 
You could do it with a friend, a critical friend from another school, or from, even from your own if you have a trusting relationship. And what did I do which made a difference? What combination of things did I do which made a difference? Did I go in and paint the classrooms a different colour? Uh, did I have staff meetings which, which were not only about information giving and bureau bureaucratic things? Did I maybe have a staff meeting sometimes which was about development, which was focused on that? What did I do? And then what did I do? And how did that affect the school? And now what am I doing? How am I sustaining and growing that? And really this is a synthesis, if you like, from a range of research which tells you that of course there are different phases of school development. This is why continuing improvement is important. You can read about this elsewhere if you want to. Part four. Now we're at the meet and we only have two minutes. No, it's not true. How long do we have? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, okay. But some of these things which I'm sharing with you now, I've already talked about. But let me start by referring again to, your situ to what the OECD says about your situation here in your own country. But before I do that, I'm going to ask you again, this is another check, reality check. Is what I'm saying still relevant to you? Yes. And you're trying to become my favorite again. Okay, you are. Even that group, is it relevant to you? Wave your hands if it's relevant, please. Thank you, thank you. Well, I got about 80%, so it's not too bad. More than half of Chilean lower secondary school teachers work in schools with more than 30% of socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Below the TALIS, that's the Teaching and Learning International Survey, of 19.6, or you can call it 20%, all right. So we know a little bit more about the relative disadvantage in the, the teachers who work in, your, in schools in vulnerable circumstances. Unlike teachers in most other countries, teachers from Chile with higher educational attainment are more than 50% less likely to work in, in schools in serving disadvantaged communities. We said this way back towards the beginning of the session we have together. So you're already more challenged as principals than principals in many, many other schools are. And then there are disparities um, between the opportunities for high quality education that students get in schools in Chile, now, in, in other countries. Now we know that um, the Chilean government has been and is con and does continue to work to reduce these disparities, but we have to look at what we have uh, as well as what we could have. And so this is something of research which I, I undertook with a Swedish colleague. So we looked at uh, principals in disadvantaged uh, schools, if you like, in Sweden and in England. And out of that research, we, one of the things we found is we were able to construct this kind of table. And it shows you what I said right, almost right at the beginning of our time together this morning. That whilst, of course, all the words in the central column would apply, or almost all of them, would apply to principals in schools in all contexts, you can see some are more essential and some are different for principals in schools who, which serve disadvantaged contexts or communities. So we see that establishing vision and setting directions, of course, it's essential for all principals in all schools, yeah? But we see that managing the teaching and learning program is challenging for schools serving relatively advantaged communities, but it's more challenging for schools serving uh, disadvantaged communities. We see that building and sustaining staff, at the bottom there, building and sustaining staff motivation and student motivation, commitment, morale and engagement is challenging for all principals in all schools, in all contexts, but it's more challenging for those who work in schools serving a relatively uh, higher disadvantaged <coughs> uh, communities. And again, you can, I'm not going to go through this list. You have it. You can reflect on it if you wish. And again, you can use this list if you want to as part of your staff development in your school. Don't keep these things to yourself, please. Select what you think is important and then share it with your staff for professional development purposes. 
So emotional literacy I've already uh, talked about. You have to keep up with me now. When positive emotions are in short supply, people get stuck. They lose their degrees of behavioral freedom and become predictable. So if I don't feel right, if, I, if the work of a teacher in my classroom has become um, emotional labor, where I don't really want to be there because it's too difficult for me to be there for different reasons, uh, then it's likely that I'll be predictable in what I do. Now, you know that teaching to your best and well is a risk. It involves risk. It involves an element of unpredictability because you don't quite know what the answer is going to be if you ask a more open question as against if you ask a more closed question. You don't even know if the person to whom you ask that question is going to give you an answer if you're working with children, again, particularly from disadvantaged communities. So it's important that you teach, you encourage, you challenge your teachers to work in their classrooms with positive emotions. And one of the ways you do that is by modeling it yourself. Hmm. Part five, immediately. Teachers matter. Wonderful. We're getting, we should do this more often. We've already said that giving the right, getting the right people into the teaching profession and developing them to become effective teachers have played a central role in enabling those systems to come out on top and keep getting better. Now, this is work from a very influential group, McKinsey. It's a private enterprise company. It's international. And governments across the world read what they say and what they advise. So it's influential. So that's important. It's obvious. We know that. I've talked about the danger of commitment fading over time. It doesn't always fade over time with teachers or indeed principals, but it may do that. And then I've talked about professional life phases already a little bit. But if I give you a moment just to look at the, some of the words on there, there aren't many words on there, <clears throat> and just to see if you can recognize some of your teachers in those words, or even you can recognize phases in your own experience in some of those words about early career teachers, mid-career teachers, and later career, what the Americans call veteran teachers. I don't like that term, veteran, because I'm one of, the, I'm one of those later career people. <laughs> I don't like to be called a veteran, no. I'd rather be called an enthusiast. <laughs> it's better. So maybe you can relate some of those words to some of the teachers in your school. Uh, and of course, it's much more complicated than this. Let me just tell you on the side, though, do you know what I really would like to do? It's just such a shame. Um, I'd really like just to take this microphone out and walk across this whole I did not do what's good job. This is something I not do with the other. Oh, oh, sorry. Now you can translate it. <laughs> oh, dear. I was just saying that I could not see this group very well from over there, so I've come just to say hello. I think you understood. And the same with here. And I was saying I love the way you wave your hands. Thank you very much. And then, then I said, well, but there is also a group right at the back there. I haven't mentioned them one at all because, actually, I haven't seen you until just now. And so I asked them, I said, well, you're important, and uh, I believe that you're as important as everyone else. And I asked them if they would agree with that, they would trust me, and they said yes. So that was my little tour. And you may be glad to know, I don't know, you may not be... All right, I'll come to you as well. Yes, you're important as well, this group here. And you're very, very, very important as well. Okay. And even the cameraman, you're even more important. Okay, good. Uh, 
And I, I did not uh, behave in this way with the other groups, uh, the other cities I visited. I'm feeling particularly warm because you're closer to me. Makes me, it's like teaching, isn't it? You know, if you can, it's like working with your staff if there's trust there. You know, you can get physically close. Teachers sometimes get physically close so they can see the eyes of the other person. And sometimes even that can make a difference. Even that can influence. Am I right? Yeah. So teaching is not about separation of teacher and learner. It's about the joining of teacher and learner in the enterprise of learning and achievement. And leading is not separation between principal and parents and principal and teachers and principal and community. It's about the joining. And you will know, those of you who particularly who lead schools in dis serving disadvantaged communities, how very, very important it is to engage the community with your school. Parents, but also, if you can, the community. And you know, there are some effective schools in, in other countries, possibly in your own country also. I'd love to visit some of your schools, incidentally. Um, I hope, maybe. We'll, we'll see. Um, but um, there are some schools in other countries of effective schools serving disadvantaged communities. And in the school, there is a special room for the parents. Yes, for the parents. And so the parents can come in and they can talk to other parents. Yeah? And they can feel that they're a more a part of the school than separate from the school. And sometimes there are parenting classes because sometimes they're very young parents and they don't know how to bring up children. And they, they genuinely want to learn. And so some principals arrange classes in the parents' room for those who want to come. There are, you know. And if, if a child doesn't come to school, do you send a note? No. You go. You visit. Or one of your staff, one of your teachers visits. So they know, the parents know, that you feel it's very important for the child to come to school. It's worth more than just a note or a telephone call. Because you're showing the investment you have in their child, not just in children. Yes? You agree? Thank you. Thank you. I'll, okay, good. Now, I'm going to put this down because the organizers will tell me off. They'll say, you're not doing the job. So I have to get back to the focus here. Okay. So you've had a look at that. Now, I said, I would ret I said that I would return to this. Um, I said a few moments ago when... I would return to this. Ah, good, excellent. These are the five, if you look on your right-hand side, or you can look at the paper you have in front of you, um, you can see that this is work in, by the New Zealand Ministry of Education, and it's what's called a best evidence synthesis of the work. Uh, and these people, led by Vivian Robinson, uh, put together about 19 or 20, some in the region of 19 or 20, quantitative studies of effective school leaders internationally. Uh, and then they analyze them. We call it a meta-analysis. They call it a best evidence synthesis. Uh, and out of that meta-analysis, uh, they identified five key dimensions of leadership. You'll see this uh, in, the horizontal, in those horizontal bars. And as I told you earlier, um, you can see that those horizontal bars are associated with each of those five key dimensions. I'm not going to read them. but. There are figures between naught and one, and we call those effect sizes. In other words, what's the impact, what's the effect of engaging in one or other of those key dimensions? Of course, they all engage in all of those key dimensions, but you can see the one, 0.84, how big the effect size is. And that's the one promoting and participating in professional learning and development. So you can see the huge difference an emphasis on professional learning and development can bring. And when we talk about professional learning and development, we're not talking about going on a course or going to a conference. We're talking about in school professional learning and development. Teachers can lead other teachers in professional learning and development. You can lead other teachers. You can engage in lesson study. You can engage in mentoring, you and your colleagues. It doesn't have to cost money 
Yeah, it may cost a little time sometimes. Yeah. But many of you will do that already. But be encouraged by this kind of um, information, this kind of data. Uh, teacher commitment counts. Very, very quickly, because I know I am running out of time. Um, positive influence. Oh, no, let, oh, no let, me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, one thing. One thing I want to tell you about commitment. Can you? Uh, no, no, no. Yes. One thing I can tell you about commitment is we often use it, don't we? In our teaching as a profession, we say, well, committed teachers are likely to be the best teachers. Committed principals are likely to be the the best principles. We say we use commitment a lot, don't we? We do. Yeah. And it's a qualitative term. Well, I can tell you that in a mix, in a large national mixed methods project, uh, that is a mix of quantitative with the qualitative research, where we looked at uh, measured pupil outcome results from tests and examinations over a three year consecutive period being taught by the, s the same teacher, right? so different groups, but they had the same teacher teaching them. When we looked at the progress and attainment through tests and examinations of those students, what did we find? Yes, we found a significant statistical correlation between what the teachers said about their commitment over a three-year period and the measured progress and attainment results of their students, yes. So it's not just a story about commitment here. Yeah. There's more evidence, more statistically, uh, statistically significant, uh, credible, if you like, evidence about the relationship between levels of teacher commitment and levels of student achievement. I wonder if there's uh, any, I don't know, there may be some evidence about uh, the effects of your commitment on your teachers and their willingness and ability to teach well and to their best. I don't know. I don't think there's been any research on that. Uh, you can see, therefore, that leadership influences are very strong, 76%. You can see that colleagues' influences are very strong, 63%. And you can see what's amazing, amazing, 95% of those 300 teachers in 100 schools, this is what this is based on here, said it's our homes which we rely upon, or our societies, if we belong to a club or a society, which we rely upon to support us in our work. That's amazing. Governments cannot provide this support. Principals can not provide this support, but they can encourage, I suppose. Now. Well, let's look at the negative side. What, what did teachers feel negatively about? Well, workload, of course, 68%. Pupil behavior, of course. That's why behavior management or behavior learning policies, as I said earlier, are essential, particularly which are agreed and carried out, are essential, particularly for schools serving disadvantaged communities. And then, of course, leadership can also be a negative as well as a positive. Uh, and that's why I, I love leaders, but I love those who lead well better than I love those who do not, as it were. Whoops, why are we going that way? Okay, so I'm moving very, very quickly now here. Um, trust. I have to talk about trust because it's the favorite subject of Professor Weinstein here in the front row. He loves trust. He works on trust. He writes about trust. He writes well about trust. Um, and he even uh, models trust. So, trust increases job satisfaction and effectiveness. Factors that have the strongest influence, according to, the, uh, to European research, upon job satisfaction are trust and fairness in the workplace, followed by a sense of community. Do you have this in your school, sense of community? Meaning of work, do teachers feel there is a meaning in what they do? Resources and work privacy conflict. This is work-life balance, always a problem. Why trust is important? Well, it's the foundation upon which social capital is built, and of course, that's related to our human capital. That's what we call uh, personal achievement of students in schools. Um, Vivian Robinson, again, using the work of um, Bryken Schneider in Chicago elementary schools, in which they found 
that the one common factor between schools which improved their maths and English results of their students over a five-year period was relational trust. Relational trust. Uh, there are other factors, but the one common factor of those 100 schools of the 300 schools which had improved over that period of time in maths and English was trust. There are lots written about trust, and I commend it to you. Now, how do we know if trust is there? Well, if you look at this here, you'll see that uh, it tells you about the use of authority by the principal and the area of freedom for teachers and leaders. And what it's basically saying is that those, where, as trust is built, so the areas of freedom um, grow. There's a phrase used a long time ago, which eh, I'm going to revive here now. It's a principal in a school who wants to have power with rather than power over teachers. Actually, it's the same in the classroom. We aim to have power with children and young people in their learning, not over. We don't want to keep telling them they have to learn this. We don't want to keep telling teachers, you have to do this. We want teachers to work with us uh, and for us to work with them. So you can, again, analyze that. Um, when we first meet somebody, and reflect upon that with your staff, if you like, when we first meet somebody, we don't necessarily trust them. We need evidence. We need to have what we call infor information to lead to informed trust. So we exercise provisional trust. So when you're first meeting me this morning, you're saying, well, OK, for one and a half hours, we'll trust this man. We don't know him. We don't sp he doesn't speak our language. He doesn't know much about our schools, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll give him the benefit of some trust initially. By the end of one and a half hours, you've realized there was no evidence that I can be trusted. <laughs> so so you, go, you smile and say, bye-bye. <laughs> we hope not. But that's just a kind of a silly example here. But it takes time, in other words, to build trust of different kinds. And we talk about individual trust. We talk about trust in individuals. We talk about relational trust, trust in the relations between individuals. And we talk about organizational or collective trust, where we have the whole organization. We call that a professional learning community. Um, OK. Final part. Did I miss something? Resilience. Yes, we're on resilience. Part six. Did I? Did, is that right? Did I do OK? Good, good, good. OK, so final part, except for the conclusions. And I'll be very quick with the conclusions, because it's 11.37, and I've been, goodness me, has it been that long? Tell me. Has it felt a long time for you? No. Wonderful. <laughs> you could not have said anything which pleased me more than that. And it's the same in the classroom when we're learning, isn't it? You know, it's what this man whose name I can never pronounce, but you can, calls flow. I don't, you don't have to. It's flow. It's when you're so engaged with the children or the young people or the staff, if you like, in what you're doing with them, that suddenly 30 minutes has gone by. And you, you, you didn't know. You thought maybe one minute or two minutes. And so it's a, it's a real compliment to a teacher from a child or a young person to say, goodness me, is it already the end of the lesson? You know, now? Gosh, or so on. So... Can we have some more? No, don't say that to me. But you can say, or to, or to a teacher, really. So that's a wonderful thing to say. So time is both objective in terms of we have 30 minutes or 50 minutes or 60 minutes uh, as a teacher with a child, or you may have 15 minutes or 10 minutes with a parent. or the Very important time. But it's also subjective. You want that time to feel for the parent or the teacher as if it's one minute and everything's gone. Or if it's been, you know, you know about this. We don't always experience this, but this is our hope. This is our aspiration to be able to engage in those kind of teaching and learning relationships with our teachers as well as with our uh, children. So you are stewards, what we call here, stewards of the organizational energy, which we call resilience. You need, and I'm not going to read this uh, either, because it's too long, there are actually too many words on the page. But just to say one or two things about resilience. 
First of all, some of you may have been brought up to believe that resilience is a trait. It's something which you either inherit or it's developed in the early years of your life and then you have it or you don't. Well, a common definition, a traditional definition also of resilience is the capacity to bounce back in highly adverse or challenging circumstances. When you look at the empirical research on teachers' capacity for resilience, you see two things. The first thing is that they exercise everyday resilience. So it's not just that they bounce back in extremely adverse circumstances. The job of teaching and learning, especially in schools serving disadvantaged communities, requires teachers to have a capacity for resilience every day not just in extremely adverse circumstances. And if you believe that, then that will lead you to understanding the job of those teachers, and it can lead you to saying, OK, it's very, very important for me as a principal to support and grow teachers' capacities for resilience, because the second thing you know from your own experience is resilience can fluctuate. Sometimes you can feel very strong inside yourself. You can withstand. Other times you feel very weak uh, for various reasons. And so it's important actually not just for you working with your teachers, but it's important for you as a principal to be able to model a high capacity for resilience. You know, I said right at the beginning, there's one person in the school who always has to look hopeful or to exercise hope or to communicate hope. It's you. It's you. And it's you. And it's you. And it's you at the back also. It's everyone who's in a leadership role, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's in the school. Okay. So key messages and conclusions. I'm not sure I can do this. I'm not going to do this, no. Um, all right. So successful leaders create both person and task-centered communities. This is what you are all trying to do. You're trying to create a community where a community has not existed before, perhaps, or improve the level of engagement of people in that community. And as part of that work, you're trying to engage students in both personal, social, and academic learning, development, and achievement. You're trying to do all of those things all the time. That's what your teachers are trying to do. That's why you have strategies. That's why you have policies. That's why you need a capacity for resilience. That's why you need teachers who are committed to um, teach to their best and well. That's why we exist. And as I said at the beginning, the real reason that we exist, the reason you're here, the reason I'm here, and I'll say it again finally, is because actually we're the only people now left in a formal sense with a formal responsibility for these things, for helping to shape pupils' values, for helping to influence pupils' values and behavior, aspirations, energies, and so on. We're among the only groups, if you like, left with that strong moral responsibility, as well as practical responsibility, as well as commitment. That's why the job you do is so important, that's why the job you do is so tiring, so complicated, so challenging, but also at its best. When you can see it in the eyes of a teacher, when you can see it in the eyes or the behavior of a student, that's what makes it worthwhile. We can change. And as a colleague of mine, now deceased, unfortunately, a long time ago wrote, it's teachers who will change the everyday world of the child. Nobody else but teachers. Maybe their parents if they're lucky. Maybe their friends if they're lucky. But essentially, for those years between naught and 18 and perhaps beyond, it's teachers. And who's responsible for influencing teachers? It's you. So I end and I say, I wish you well. I wish you sustained passion, sustained commitment, and also remember that sometimes you have to take a break. Muchas gracias.
over there. Cool. Yeah. Actually, got one. <laughs> Shall I take that? Bien, agradecemos eh, esta tremenda presentación al profesor Christopher Day, una magistral charla que nos ha entregado en el día de hoy. Como lo decíamos al principio, tenemos eh, este tiempo de preguntas. Quien tenga ya escrita su pregunta la puede entregar, puede levantar su mano para que nosotros vayamos hacia ustedes para entregarle las preguntas al director del CETLE para que el profesor Christopher Day responda las preguntas inquietudes de ustedes. Si hay más preguntas, por favor. Bueno, vamos a empezar estos minutos finales que podemos disfrutar y aprender del, de la larga experiencia y conocimientos que tiene nuestro súper invitado hoy día, el profesor Christopher Day. Eh, entonces vamos a ir dando algunas de las preguntas que se han dado. Una de las preguntas que se le hace al profesor Day tiene que ver con qué le parece a usted que es importante para el diseño del de la formación de los líderes, de los líderes escolares, tanto en, el, en, el, en la formación más inicial como también en la formación de en entrenamiento en servicio. ¿Cuáles serían como algunas claves que usted pondría para hacer un buen trabajo de, de, de formación? Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. I think the, uh, what we have in most in different countries, um, is a lot of uh, emphasis at the moment uh, on um, competences, management, com management competences, if you like, um, values also. Um, but we don't have very much emphasis on many of the things implied by what I've been talking to you today about, which uh, is the emotional competences, if you like, of head teachers. Uh, the diagnostic competences of head teachers, the discern what I call discernment or just in time or relevant judgment decision making of head teachers. Um, and if you remember the, uh, the colored table I put up with all the boxes on earlier, um, I don't think that many of the training programs uh, recognize the uh, importance of combining and accumulating combinations of, combinations of strategies in, in your work. And yet it's, pretty, it's logical, because if your work is complex, involves different people, different tasks, different contexts, uh, then good or effective head teachers need to learn to manage, to well, first of all, to acknowledge that there are They must use combinations over time, and the, the combinations may be different in different phases of development. Uh, but in order to use those well, they need to have people who trust them. They, they need to have people who are resilient. They need, in other words, to move from power over to power with, in, in a, in a, to be simplistic about it. Um, so it's individual skills and qualities and values, but also Uh, influencing. You know, I talked about um, change. Again, not many leadership training programs really explicitly focus on change. Uh, and change is, we know from research, that change is most usually effectively um, achieved by social influence, not positional influence. So the interpersonal skills are very important, as, of course, used with integrity. Muchas gracias. 
Una segunda pregunta habla de un tema distinto. Dice, la persona dice, bueno, vimos, habla de que se ha hablado mucho del liderazgo directivo y los profesores y la relación entre el liderazgo del director y los profesores y los adultos de la escuela. Sin embargo, ya esta persona dice, vivimos en una sociedad adultocéntrica. Entonces, le hubiera gustado escuchar qué es lo que ocurre con la creación del liderazgo en niños y en niñas. ¿Usted cree que eso es relevante? ¿Cómo se podría generar ese, esa, ese liderazgo entre los niños y niñas de tal manera que sean efectivamente lo, el actor esencial, como usted dijo, de la escuela? Bueno, mm, mm, mm. well, What this question uh, uh, is implying is that schools have democratic values. That's the implication. Um, democratic equals participation. Uh, participation equals participation by all of the stakeholders. Therefore, it's logical for this questioner, whoever it is, uh, to suggest that children, young people, should be involved, should be participating actively in the, in the life of the school, not as people who receive education, but people who receive and also can provide education. So, for example, in some schools we have, in a, this is a small example, in some schools we have uh, uh, children who evaluate their teaching. We sometimes evaluate their teachers. <gasps> terrible, terrible, terrible. But if, if again, it's, if the conditions for that evaluation are already established, uh, uh, for instance, as trust between adults and children, young people, a collective uh, recognition that the best learning is achieved by collaboration and not separate, or integration, not separation, then of course the logic is you would say, yes, children can be leaders. And actually, we talk about sometimes teachers doing research in their classrooms. I gave an example of lesson study as an example of uh, teachers doing research. You can find schools, effective schools, where children, small children, not just big children, are engaged in conducting research using the methods which are applicable to them in their particular stage of development in their life, of course, Um, but nevertheless, asking questions about their own learning, asking questions about their own classroom, asking, finding out systematically. And, and if you consider this, this can help the teacher. This can inform the teacher uh, uh, about their teaching and learning and about what children feel and what children do and, and what children <coughs> learn and so on. So you can see, but it's based on a, de on a democratic ideal, if you like. But there are schools which are fulfilling that ideal. So it's not impossible to do at all. Sometimes it's harder in some schools than others, but it's something which you can build as part of this democratic school, if that's what you want to call it. Muchas gracias, profesor. Aquí hay una pregunta de un director, eh, Daniel Ramírez, que viene de la Escuela Oscar, Oscar Castro de Concepción. ¿Está el profesor Ramírez? ¿Está aquí? Profesor Ramírez. Muchas gracias por su pregunta, además por venir de Concepción a escuchar esta charla, no, no es menor su esfuerzo. Eh, la pregunta que hace el director es cómo asumir la condición de vulnerabilidad, pero no estigmatizar a las personas. Es decir, cómo tiene que ser tratado, así interpreto yo, el, el hecho de la vulnerabilidad, cómo denominarla, cómo tratarla de una manera que efectivamente se reconozca la condición, pero no signifique una estigmatización. Debo decir que en relación a esta pregunta, como con el profesor, con el profesor Day, ya hemos hecho como una suerte de gira respecto a este tema, este tema también salió en otros lugares, salió en Temuco, por ejemplo, en la cual una de las personas asistentes, eh, se que era nada menos que el Ceremi de Educación, ¿ya? le pareció extraordinariamente mal que nosotros llamáramos al seminario de escuelas vulnerables, ¿ya? porque efectivamente la vulnerabilidad a su juicio podía crear como esta imagen también de estigmatización. ¿ya? Bueno, nosotros obviamente respondimos que vulnerables éramos todos, somos todos. ¿ya? Pero independientemente de eso, la verdad es que es cierto, los lenguajes quedan realidades y también, ¿no es cierto?, cuál es la manera adecuada de referirse a esta situación de tal manera de hacer la diferencia, poner más recursos, pero al mismo tiempo no estigmatizar. Es una pregunta que raza un dilema, más que un problema. Because it's not something which a, a school can entirely solve. 
Because as I said, uh, as you know, is every evening the children go back to live in their community and so on. So there's an, an influence there. Um, uh, so we, we, I can use a, a broad term, inclusivity. So if, in other words, if, if what's most important to a child is to have a positive self-image, positive sense of identity. If, if we have that positive sense of identity, then we can acknowledge and understand and accept that there will be differences, yeah? but that we're all valued in the same way. So in, sm in small but very significant ways, for instance, a school may have a policy which separates off children with special educational needs. Many of these will be vulnerable, come from vulnerable communities. So they put them in another room. So the children think, why are we being put into this room? Or we have schools which have a different kind of policy where they integrate. So there may be in the same classroom children from poor homes, children from less poor homes, children with other special one disability needs, uh, maybe a mental disability needs. Of course, the extreme of those needs has to be separated off for the benefit of those children. But there are many in between. So it depends what you mean by vulnerability. Uh, is it vulnerability as learners? Is it vulnerability as social animals? Is it vulnerability according to economics? Or what is it? But teachers, it, if, if the government, and I think the government does believe in promoting equity in schools, then it's the job of the principals in those schools if they also, if you also believe in equity, then it's your job to make sure in practical terms that the grouping of the children reflects that in the classroom, that the behavior of the teachers in the classroom reflects that. So, you know, in the olden days, many, many years ago, there was, um, there was a, a researcher I mentioned called, um, an American called Philip Jackson. And many, many, many years ago, but it stays with me all the time. He wrote a book called Life in Schools. And he identified three characteristics, no, life in classrooms, sorry. Uh, and he identified three characteristics of classrooms. One was crowds, because classrooms are crowded places. Doctors don't work in crowded places. Lawyers don't work in crowded places. Social workers don't, but teachers do work in crowded places. There's a difference. Right, so, so we have crowds, we have power, because teachers have power. Sometimes, as we heard earlier in the question, children might have more power, um, some equality of power perhaps. But the third one is the one I want to use in answer to you a little. The third one he recognized, he, he, he saw in classrooms, praise, praise. And what he saw in classrooms was an absence of praise. It was much more criticism of children by the teacher than praise of the children by the teacher. Yeah? And of course, you can't learn without making mistakes. But some teachers criticize children for making mistakes. It's, a, it's amazing. Because mistakes, as you know, can be used as a means of learning. Right? That's in the academic sense. But we also know, to be realistic, there are teachers who are prejudiced about children in one way or another. We know this in all countries, in all schools. And part of our job, if you like, as leaders is to maybe it needs continuing professional development uh, programs with teachers. Maybe it needs mentoring. Maybe it needs coaching. But it's certainly you need to know what goes on in classrooms which separates children. Because what you want and we want in our schools is what happens in classrooms to bring children together. In what I say, I don't imply, please don't believe that I imply that it's easy. It's not easy. And it's not easy because sometimes you're working against the community. You're working against parents uh, of different children from different backgrounds. But this is something we must fight. And we must try to resolve. This is why I call it a dilemma. You can never solve it entirely, but you can keep working 
in order to resolve it or to try to resolve it. Gracias, profesor. Diferencia entre dilema y problema. Se hace una pregunta, voy a fundir dos preguntas. Eh, una, una pregunta que se hace tiene que ver con, se pregunta, bueno, como directores, ¿qué se puede hacer con, cuando tenemos profesores como la persona que usted escribió en el aeropuerto, como esta joven que usted escribió en el aeropuerto, que están ahí y que claramente no tienen esta vocación, sin embargo están en su trabajo? ¿Y qué es lo que se puede hacer con ellas? ¿Cómo se... Y hay otra pregunta que también se hace que va en un poco en la misma dirección, que dice si se puede si los directivos pueden, de alguna manera, cambiar los valores de los profesores, si son esos valores cambiables, si eso es, es, es realizable. Un gran educador americano educationalist called John Dewey. Some of you will know John Dewey's work, perhaps. He used a phrase which um, I, this reminds me of. Uh, and even the previous question reminded me of this. It's called, we have ends in view. As school leaders, as teachers, we have ends in view. We may not achieve those ends whilst the child or the teacher is in our school. Uh, or we may, but we want to achieve those. Okay. Incidentally, the story I told you about the airport was a true story. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't, I didn't it's not a fiction. Uh, so. Um, and we know, we do know, as I think I said in the talk, we do know that there will be teachers in your schools who are, have strong moral purpose, for whom teaching is the first choice, but then there'll be other teachers also. And that's part of the art of leadership, as well as the science of management, if you like. Um, yeah. And this is why we have coaching, Uh, this is why we have mentoring. And one of the ways in which we can sometimes resolve the problem of different um, motivations, if you like, which exist in your schools, is by the use of evidence. Uh, and by the use of evidence which, first of all, the individual can see. So the individual can see that perhaps they're not benefiting the children as much as they could. The individual can see that their values are different from 90% of the other members of the school, 60%, whatever it is. You know, I talked about building a culture in the school, building a culture of inclusivity. That's inclusivity of values. Uh, now, there's, a, there's a, another dilemma here, because you may have someone for whom teaching is not the first choice, but is doing a competent job. So where do you go then? What, what's the choice do you make then? Do you say, no, no, we must make this person vocationally strong with stronger moral purpose? Or do we say, no, she or he is doing a competent job, leave them alone? You can ask yourself that question. I would not leave them alone. <laughs> I would not leave them alone because my, my purpose is for the best possible education for the children, not at this level, but at the highest level that I can. So I always have to be working for this. And if teachers are in your, in your school, which is not their first choice, or they're tired, or they, their career development hasn't been good for them, it's part of your work is to change that. Yeah? And there are different ways of doing that. I remember when I was working as a leader, uh, uh, and this particular teacher said to me, when I arrived in the school, You will never change me. He said. I didn't even know him. He said, don't think you're going to change me. I'm not going to change at all. Um, and actually, I never changed him. In the time I was there, I never changed him. But somebody else whom I knew changed him. Uh, so I didn't have to be the one who changed. I shared that leadership with someone who was much better than me at forming a relationship and influencing the, this person. But you know, it's like, it's like any teaching and learning in a classroom. You, you do it knowing that you won't succeed with everyone, but you still do it, because that's your, your moral purpose, if you like. Hmm. I'm sorry I can't give a practical formula 
to do this, but I can't. <laughs> I don't know of one. Bueno, se le hacen además otras preguntas más técnicas al profesor respecto también de cómo usar las ecuaciones estructurales en, en la investigación, cómo medir la confianza. A ver a esas personas que se acerquen al profesor al final de esta charla, de tal manera de llevar esas inquietudes más a nivel personal. Y también hay alguien que le propone al, al profesor que conozca a Gabriela Mistral, de tal manera que también conozca algo respecto a nuestro pensamiento pedagógico y poético. Así que, sin más, les dejo. Les pido, por favor, que despidamos al profesor con un gran aplauso. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.